Okay, yeah, good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. So we have uh, two more lectures left. My plan for the two lectures. Uh, today I'm going to solve a problem. Okay, on uh, fluid systems, hydraulic systems, particularly. And then on Wednesday I'm going to solve another problem. It will be very closely aligned with your homework problem, so that you just take that off and complete it in your home. Okay. Your homework is still due on Wednesday. Um, as of now, there's only one problem that we haven't had a chance to look at, which is the last problem of the homework. That being said, I'm happy to have the due date on Thursday, but please submit your work by Wednesday. Okay, so officially the due date is on Wednesday. I'm happy to take it on Thursday as well. Okay? All right. Um, so, back to hydraulic systems. Please, I urge you uh, to take a look at the analogy that we looked at last class. Uh, that's a very important part of this course. And sometimes that analogy is enough to help you come up with equations of the systems. Okay? All right. So to start off, uh, we're going to look at a very simple problem. Okay? This is a problem of a fluid tank. So here is a rectangular fluid tank, uh, which means that the area of the tank is going to be a constant. I'll show you all those things in a minute. A rectangular fluid tank receives fluid liquid okay, at a rate of uh, QMI. This is the inlet flow rate, the mass flow rate. It can be given in terms of the volumetric flow rate as rho times QI. Okay. And then there is... Uh, an outlet pipe, fluid obviously flows from the inlet onto the outlet, but as it flows through the outlet, there is a certain resistance to its flow. Okay, this is the symbol for fluid resistance. Okay, as you can see, that small box thing there. This resistance can be due to fluid friction, it could be due to probably the area of cross section of the valves changing, and so on and so forth. It could be due to the viscosity of the fluid, which is essentially fluid friction. It could be due to the velocity of the fluid, and so on and so forth. Okay? Fluid flows out. The outlet flow rate of the fluid is Q M O. If you have the subscript M, it means it's a mass flow rate. And you combine that with density to give the volumetric flow rate. Okay? And this fluid flows out into the outside pressure, so atmospheric pressure, so Pa. Atmospheric pressure, okay, this is, obviously there is a certain height of the fluid that is varying as a function of time. And here are the things that we are told. Okay? So this QI is the inlet volumetric flow rate units of meters cube per second. Okay, this is given as the following is some QI. S, Q suffix I S plus del Q I of T. What does this mean? Obviously. It means that the inlet volumetric flow rate is comprised of two parts. One part is some kind of an average value which stays constant, which is this Q I S, and then there is a slight <coughs> perturbation or a slight disturbance about this average value, okay? So QIS is some average constant value. And this del QI of T is a perturbation or a disturbance
about the average value. Okay, so some slight changes in the flow rate. This could be due to pressure differences. This could be due to the, the fluid could be coming from a pump. The pump could have some inefficiencies and so on. So there is some small fluctuations in the flow rate. And as a matter of this, we are going to see that H of T is HS <coughs> plus some delta H. Okay, I'm going to write out what these things mean. And Q out is QOS delta Q naught or delta Q naught, where HS and QOS are the steady or average fluid height and outlet flow rates volumetric when the inlet flow is QIS. Once again, just a brief recap. This is a fluid tank system. Okay, this could be a part of a processing unit. You could have a series of tanks. Right? They could all be connected one to the other. It could be part of a filtration system. There is fluid coming from some source. I don't, don't really care where it comes from. Maybe a pump, and it's coming at an inlet mass flow rate of QMI, which is related to the volumetric flow rate as rho times QI. This fluid is going to flow out at a volumetric flow rate of Q0 and we are told that there is a certain resistance to the flow of the fluid going out and this resistance is given by this character capital R. This is the fluid resistance. And you are told that the inlet rate itself is comprised of these two pieces. One is a steady or a constant or an average value okay? and there is a slight perturbation about the average value. If there was no perturbation if the inlet flow rate was exactly QIS, then what would happen is that the height of the fluid would be HS, the outlet flow rate would be Q. But because there is perturbation, because there is a disturbance to the inlet flow, there is going to be a slight disturbance to the height of the fluid as well. There is a slight disturbance to the fluid flowing out as well. Okay? What are we supposed to do in this problem? If the flow resistance is given as some constant times square root h of t. You'll recognize this and you'll make a relation to the homework problem we have. Then obtain transfer function relating delta q naught and delta q And if the resistance is a nonlinear function of the fluid height, it means the flow through the pipe is turbulent. Okay, I'm going to talk about this as well in a second. In your homework problem, what you have is you have two tanks, one connected to the other. Today I'm going to look at the first tank. On Wednesday I'm going to come back and fit another tank and look at a two tank model. It will be very representative of what you're seeing in your homework and this is solely because we don't have enough lectures to cover a variety of problems. Okay? Alright, so this is what we need, transfer function. If I know the transfer function and if I know that the input to the system, what's the input to the system? This is the system input. What is the output of the system? Output of the system is the flow rate that's coming up, right? So this is the system output. And obviously the transfer function is going to relate the input and the output. Okay? And if I know the transfer function, I know many things about the system. I know its stability. 
And if the input is sinusoidal, if the perturbation is sinusoidal, then I can also find out, okay, what is the outlet perturbation going to be? Perhaps I have a low pass filter, which means that for large frequencies of the input per perturbations, I don't see any effect on my system behavior at all. Or I could have a high pass filter on the other side. Right? You've seen these from uh, electrical systems, I presume. Okay. Let's begin. <coughs> Fundamental or governing equation, and before I do that, I wrote down one thing, and I guess I'll come back to it. So the governing equation for fluid systems is the following. The governing equation for mechanical systems was Newton's law, and uh, also the moment balance, the Newton Euler equations. Governing equation for electrical systems was Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws. Here it's conservation of mass. The rate of change of mass stored within the control volume, right? I'm not going to use those fancy terms. The rate of change of mass within the tank is nothing but the inlet flow rate into the tank. minus the outlet flow rate out of the tank. Okay, this is a fundamental equation. This equation never changes. If I have two tanks, I will write two such equations. What type of an equation is this? This is a first order ordinary differential equation. We don't know if it is linear or not linear. We will figure out. Okay? But this does not tell me anything about anything, so we have to whittle it down. First things first. <coughs> QMI I can write it as rho times QIF. Okay, so that's the first simplification that we make. Second thing is I look at the tank itself. It's some kind of a rectangle, okay, or if I draw it in a three-dimensional viewpoint, some cuboid. So that's going to be the level of the fluid in there. Obviously, I have the outlet and inlet. I'm not drawing that. But this is the height. And you see, for this kind of a tank, the area of cross-section, that if I'm slicing it along the width of the tank, right, along the third dimension, this area remains a constant. Okay? Let me call that as capital A, so this area here. I call it as capital A, and this area is a constant. In my lecture notes, I am posting an analogous problem where the area is no longer a constant. It will be a conical tank. Okay? So please take a look at that as well. The idea is exactly the same. There is no change involved, but the area is no longer a constant. It's a function of the fluid height. Here it's a constant. So if the area is a constant, then I can write the mass of the fluid, so M, density times the volume of the fluid, right? Volume is, in this particular situation, area times the height. So this is rho times A times H of T, which means if I do dm by dt, it is rho times A times So one piece of the puzzle is taken care of. This is just given to us, that's the input. I need to look at QMO. You don't need to redraw this. I'm just redrawing the tank there. I'm going to label two locations, okay? One before the output, some location one, and then another location right after the output, some location two. The flow resistance is capital R. And 
the flow itself is atmospheric pressure atmospheric pressure H of okay. Now something that I'm not going to derive is the expression for hydrostatic pressure. The derivation will be in my lecture notes. It's fairly straightforward. But if you have gone swimming, you'll realize that as you go deeper into the water, the pressure increases. This is exactly what's happening here as well. I'm sitting at atmospheric pressure right on the top. As I keep going further and further and further into the tub here, the pressure is going to increase. And if I'm at a common height, so if I'm at a height here, 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 all of those are on the same height, the pressure at all those points will be the same. If I'm at a different height, the pressure will be different. Okay? And the hydrostatic pressure, expression for that, for a generic, tub filled with fluid, okay, if I choose two points, some location 1 of pressure P1, location 2 of pressure P2, if the change in height between the two locations is delta H, then the pressure at location 2 is pressure at location 1 plus a quantity. Rho times Z times delta H. This is a common expression for hydrostatic pressure. This derivation will be posted in the lecture notes if you're interested. But this is the expression we're going to use. Okay? And P1 and P2 are absolute pressures. I always work with absolute pressures, but people also use gauge pressure, which is absolute pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. Okay? We will not be looking at it. So this is the situation. Now watch this. I'm going to recall from our previous lecture that resistance, flow resistance, <coughs> R, is the same as electrical resistance. Electrical resistance is change in voltage by the current flow. Change in voltage is analogous to pressure difference. Okay, so in this case, this is back to our problem. It is pressure at the higher location, P capital 1, minus divided by the flow rate. Okay, this is an expression that we looked at in the last class, just based on pure analogy. Okay, we did not derive anything. Am I making sense to everybody so far? Okay. Now, what is P1 minus P2? Right, that's what we have to write out here. P2 is the atmospheric pressure. Right, because the fluid is flowing out into the atmosphere. What is P1? P1 is, I can use any height to locate the pressure P1, but why not use the total height of the fluid itself, right? I can say that it is the atmospheric pressure at the free surface of the fluid, plus rho times G times the change in the height. Okay, so that's going to be rho times G times H of T. And so P1 is PA plus rho G H of it. And I want to see if there are any questions. So, yes. So, what about the width of the outlet tube? We're going to assume it's very small. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a valid point. Uh, the question was, is, okay, what, is, what about this variation here? We're going to assume that this is very small compared to the height of the fluid. Absolutely. Okay. So, you are, you are not wrong in choosing a point somewhere here or a point somewhere there as well. It will be the same pressure. Okay. More or less. Okay, so with this, I'm going to rewrite some of these things on the uh, top panel. I'm going to pull the top.
estamos poniendo el dado. You don't need to copy this, but this is what we have so far. So story so far, I have the conservation of mass equation. Then we were able to relate dm by dt to the height of the fluid. We were able to relate the inlet flow rate to the volumetric inlet flow rate. The last relationship is the relationship between the fluid resistance and so on and so forth. So R is P1, P2 by QMO or QMO I can write it as the change in the pressure. So P1 is PA plus rho GH. P2 is PA. So if I do this calculation, PA plus rho GH minus PA, the atmospheric pressure term cancels off. So if you take the difference in pressure, it's the same as the difference in gauge pressure. Makes no difference. Okay, so this is rho G H of T divided by And I assume it's common knowledge that there are two types of fluid flows. Right? One is laminar flow, where fluid flows in a nice layer by layer fashion. Okay? And then there is turbulent fluid flow, where you have a huge amount of momentum diffusivity, momentum mixing, and so on. Lots of energy generation, energy destroying, and things like that take place for fluid energy, not for total energy. Okay? And based upon these, you can either have the resistance to be a constant if you have laminar flow. So laminar flow. This is flow in smooth stream lines. Stream lines is nothing but a fancy word for layers. Okay, it's flow in smooth layers. And uh, here, fluid resistance R is a constant. Can have turbulent flow. In turbulent flow, there is a large amount of energy mixing taking place, and so the flow is no longer smooth. You'll have wakes and so on and chaos taking place and all kinds of things. And in this situation, the flow resistance is no longer linear. Okay. R is non-linear. Non-linearly related to fluid height. Which is exactly the relationship we are given. So, if you are given a nonlinear relationship either for the resistance or for the flow rate, you have turbulent flow. Okay? Alright, so with that said, because R is whatever given to us, so QMO is rho GH by. C times root of H, because R is C times root of H. Simplify this. This is rho times G by C times root of H.
And this quantity g by c, I'm just going to call it as a constant alpha. So say some constant. So that QMO, which is first of all related to the outlet volumetric flow rate, which is rho times Q naught, is now rho times alpha times h of t. Okay, I'm just taking the relationship that we have used here. That comes from there. Okay. This is nothing but the relationship between mass flow rate and volumetric flow, which is rho times q. With all that said and done, I'm going to do my substitutions. I want to see if there are any questions. Okay, let's substitute. So dm by dt is rho times a times dh by dt. That's the governing equation is where you do all the substitutions. So rho times a times dh by dt. Qmi is rho times qi. That's one. Then I have qmo, which is rho times alpha times root of h. Okay. And I also have the relationship between Q0 and root of H. These are my two relationships. As you can see, the first relationship comes from the conservation of mass. The second one comes from the last statement that we have written on the top panel. Okay? You will see next semester that this is the fundamental form in which all control systems will be related or written. Okay, you will have a governing relationship, and then you will have a relationship between the output and one of the governing parameters. Okay. Obviously, get rid of all the density terms. We are looking at hydraulic systems. So the density is a constant. And so I have the following equations. I'm going to take the factor of A, spread its goodness on the other side. So the dH by dt is 1 by A, qi of t, they're all functions of time, qi, minus alpha by A root of h. And then the second equation, this is equation 1, is Q0 is alpha root of H. And this is where our problem actually begins. First question to you. This is a differential equation, correct? It's an ordinary differential equation, correct? Is it linear or non-linear? First of all, remember what is the dependent variable here? The dependent variable is the one whose derivative appears. That is, h of t is a dependent variable. Look at the equation. Do you see? All the dependent variable terms being a linear term. There is a square root of h, which means this is a nonlinear first order ordinary differential equation. If you have something nonlinear, can you apply Laplace transforms? You cannot. Not in this way. Okay? So this is nonlinear due to square root of h. Okay? It's the first order, does not matter. And because it's nonlinear, I cannot apply Laplace transform, so what should I do? We have to linearize it. Okay? So this is also nonlinear.
but it is not a differential equation, it is just a relationship between the control parameter h of t and the output parameter q0. Okay? Alright, so we have to linearize. To apply Laplace transform techniques. With your permission, I'm going to get rid of this particular panel. Okay. First things first, what happens to these governing equations and the output and variable height equations when I maintain the input at a constant rate of qis? If input follow rate is qis, what happens to equation 1? Height h of t becomes? Hs, which you say constant, q0 becomes q0 of s, which is also a constant, and obviously d by dt of Hs is 0, right? This is equal to qis <coughs> a alpha by a square root of hs and q naught of s is alpha times root of hs. This is a no-brainer. If the input flow rate is held at a constant rate, the output flow rate is also going to become constant. There will be no accumulation of mass so that the input and the output rate will be the same. That is exactly what this equation is going to tell me because this creature is 0. Okay? So if I have that situation, and I'm going to get rid of this particular panel here. Okay? If I have a situation where everything is maintained very nicely at a constant rate, I have the following. Is by a minus alpha by a as equation three, and then of course I have q naught of s is equation four. Something that we will reuse. I'm going to rewrite equations 1 and 2. You don't need to. All of these are functions of time. So this is qi of t. Obviously, Q0 is also Q0 of t. Okay. I'm going to call this first function on the right hand side of equation 1. Please notice this is a function f, it's a function of qi and it's a function of h. And it's not linear. Does this make sense to you? Okay. Then I also call the second one, I'm going to call it as a function g. It's a function of only the height h, but that's also a nonlinear function. And what we want to do is we want to take these two nonlinear functions and we want to linearize them 
around what we call as an operating point. Operating point can mean different things in mechanical systems, they're called equilibrium points. Equilibrium points are where the system is in equilibrium. It has the same meaning here as well. The system is in equilibrium, that is there is no accumulation of mass when the inlet flow rate is at a steady or a constant level. Okay, when QI is QIS, there is no dh by dt, right? So that's called as an operating point. Okay, so we need to linearize the functions f and g about an operating point. And this operating point is going to be the steady flow rate, inlet flow rate, QIS and HS. Okay? And I'm going to call this as OP, operating point. using Taylor series. You've seen it before, but you're going to see it again. All right, so we're going to start the linearization of the first term. Okay, so f, I'm going to call its linear brother as f suffix L. <laughs> function at the operating point. Okay, so f at qis hs Taylor series. When you're doing the Taylor series, you can do it up to infinite number of terms, obviously. But we're going to stop at the first order term because we want to linearize the system. Okay, you want to stop at the linear term. Plus, this is a function of two time-dependent variables, so you're going to have two first order terms in the Taylor series. First is for QI, right? So it's going to be QI minus whatever you chose as the operating point multiplied by the partial derivative of the function with respect to the first variable of the function evaluated at the operating point plus The second variable of the function, first and second is your own preference, I don't really care. This is going to be h minus hs partial of the height evaluated at the operating point. And we're going to do this step by step. Okay? First step. F Without calculating it, can you tell me what this value is going to be? Equation three. Equation 3, which is 0. Right, so that first term is going to vanish, but just for our own sake, this is just going to be the function evaluated at the operating point, which is 0. Okay, that is coming from equation 3. Okay. Then I do the partial derivatives. And uh, for that, I'm going to clear off some of these uh, portions of the board. Okay. I'm going to take the first uh, couple of lines. These. So the first derivative, df by dqi is d by dqi. This is one of the few problems that I'll show you all the steps, OK? And this is the total function. Evaluated at the operating point, the evaluation done after the differentiation. 
place. Okay, you do this from basic Taylor series. How do I differentiate this? There is only one term containing qi. That's why you have a partial derivative because there are two time varying functions here. So this is just going to be 1 by a. I do the derivative of the second one, df by dh is d by dh, ui by a, alpha by a, root of h. First term does not undergo differentiation because there is no h. The second term is a square root h. So do the differentiation, then do the substitution. So minus alpha by 2a, h to the power, minus 1 by 2 differentiation. Okay? And evaluate that. 2is and hs. This gives me minus alpha by 2a, hs to the power, minus 1. Those partial derivative terms should always give you some constants. They should not give you any time varying functions. Okay? They will always be constants. I'm going to call this as some constant k1. Okay? This is also a constant. Call it as a constant k2. I want to put the negative sign because I want to show you something. Substitute all of this back into the linear is function fl for fl qi and hs and notice qi is qis plus delta qi, which means qi minus qis is delta qi. And likewise, h minus hs is delta h. Once again, what are we doing here? We have the fluid tank system. Some inlet flow rate, some outlet flow rate. I want to relate the inlet and the outlet flow rates. Apply conservation of mass. What that gives me a nonlinear governing equation. So we have to linearize it. How do you linearize it? Taylor series. What do you linearize about? You linearize about the operating point or the equilibrium point of the system. When is the system at equilibrium? When the inlet flow rate is at a constant or a steady value. That's about it, right? I substitute. This first term vanishes. And so I have df by dqi at the operating point is a constant k1. So this is some k1 delta qi. Then the second one is minus k2 delta h. G of H, I need to linearize this as well, okay, because this is also nonlinear. So GL is first of all G evaluated at the operating point. This is a function of only H, so this is just G at H S plus H minus H S D G by D H. I actually don't need the partial derivative here because it's a function of only one 
function of time. <laughs> D of HS is alpha times is actually zero from before. Okay, this was called equation four earlier. Dg by dh is some constant. I'm just going to call it as d by dh alpha root h is some constant. That's just what it is, it's an equation. It's not zero. I write DL, which is Q0. This is a linearized version of Q0. This is nothing but alpha times HS plus some constant K3, dH of T. Alpha times root of H S is Q naught S. So that's what I meant to write there. This is Q naught S. And so Q naught is Q naught S. Bring the Q naught onto the other side. It's Q naught of T minus Q naught S is del Q naught. Any questions so far? First linearization was for the function FL, which was on the right hand side of the derivative of dh. Okay. The second one is for the outlet flow rate because I want to relate the linearized version of this, which is nothing but the perturbation, to the perturbation in the fluidite pitch, which is the relationship that we have. Then you write everything out. Notice T by dt h of t, h of t is hs plus delta. So this is which is d delta h by Last step is collecting everything and writing them together. So start off. DH This is not going to be the linearized version of all of the equations. Instead of DH by DT, it's D delta H by DT. Okay. 